Welcome to Grove Bites. I'm Richard Steele. Grove Bites are short interviews with the authors of some of the latest Grove books. My guest today is Mark Arnold, author of the Grove book, How to Include Autistic Children and Young People in Church. Welcome to Grove Bites, Mark. Great to have you with us. Great to be here, Richard. Thanks for having me. Now, Mark, the, the subtitle of your book is interesting, um, Creating a Place of Belonging in Spiritual Development for All. Now, that suggests you don't feel it's like that at the moment? Well, it, it, it certainly isn't everywhere. There are, are pockets where this is done really well. But uh, for many uh, autistic children and young people and their families, that that isn't the case. And sadly, uh, I get to hear all the stories of where it's gone wrong and where uh, children, young people and their families certainly don't feel that they belong. But even in places where children and young people uh, have a sense of belonging, so often the focus within churches can be almost sort of childminding, really. Uh, just uh, sort of keeping an eye on a child or young person, giving them something to do whilst perhaps a, a, another family member is engaged elsewhere in, in church. And, and actually forgetting the really important bit of, uh, of developing the spiritual faith and you know, faith formation uh, of children and young people. And it should be the same for autistic children and young people as it is for any other child or young person. And sometimes that gets missed. Thank you. Uh, you begin uh, with, uh, with, with talking about some myths about autism. Would you mind tell, tell me what, what sort of myths do you think are out there? Oh gosh, there are there are so many uh, myths that that uh, are out there. Um, you know that uh, all autistic children and young people are uh, like the character Rain Man, uh, and uh, you know, and ha or uh, you know, just uh, that all uh, autistic children and young people um, uh, are the same. Whereas actually, you know, there's there's a huge diversity and difference across autistic children and young people like there are across children and young people generally you know we, we, we often uh, think of children and young people with additional needs or you know, autistic as as all being the same whereas the reality is very different mm. i'm interested actually one of the myths you do say is and it's something that people have been using very positively i think in the last few years you know we're all on the spectrum somewhere and you say that's just not true can, well, can you no. unpack that a little bit so uh, autism is a, a, a difference in the way that the brain is wired. It's a neurodiversity. Uh, and that, that wiring, that, that different wiring of the brain happens during uh, you know, fetal development uh, and in those very early formative uh, times. And so you're either autistic or you're not. Uh, we can't be a little bit autistic. It's, it's one or the other, really. Uh, now, what people confuse is they they identify what they think of as perhaps some uh, autistic traits or or things that they associate with autistic people and then attribute them to to other people that they feel might be uh, perhaps showing similar traits but that you're either autistic or you're not you can't be a, a little bit autistic and and so that's that's another of those myths that we bust in the book. OK. And you also say you don't you don't like terms like mild or severe or high functioning, low functioning. You don't find them helpful. Mm. Is that part of the same issue and, and the, the differences there? Yeah, certainly it's connected with that. So uh, there are all sorts of, of things. So if you take a, an autistic child or young person, uh, they uh, they might have um, uh, other uh, additional needs or health conditions or uh, uh, things that influence their lives uh, to a, a greater or lesser degree. Uh, but often that can all be bundled up in uh, the way that people perceive their autism. And, and so hence you get terms like you know, high functioning or low functioning and, and these kinds of things, which uh, aren't uh, necessarily connected to being autistic, but might be connected to perhaps a child or young person also having a learning disability, uh, for example. So, uh, yeah, we, we try and steer away from those sorts of terms and, and the inevitable comparisons that those terms can mm. then create. Mm. OK, turning to particularly the context of church, you list quite a range and quite a long list of barriers uh, that make church life difficult for autistic young people. Mm. Uh, things that most of us might not think of. What sort of things do you, do, do, you, do you think are the most important? 
So in the in the book, we split those barriers down into three sections. Uh, there's uh, barriers that uh, are premises related, the place mm. in which we meet, and and those could be uh, you know, things like uh, loud, echoey rooms, uh, uh, bright fluorescent uh, lighting, for example, you know, strong smells if. Uh, if it's a church that you know, serves coffee and, and those sorts of things, uh, yeah, lots of people there. L things to do with the, the actual place in which we meet and do stuff. Then there's program barriers, barriers that uh, that, that exist because the, the programs we put in place aren't always geared towards the needs of autistic children and young people. So, uh, yeah, we, uh, for example, might have uh, a lot of uh, program related to, uh, to to song, and there's nothing wrong with with song and with worship and with singing. Uh, but are, are all of those songs you know, quite loud uh, uh, songs, which uh, people are expected to join in with different actions and things, or are there other ways that uh, children and young people can engage? May, are there some quieter uh, moments that uh, children and young people can uh, engage with? And then there are people. Uh, uh, barriers as well, things that people uh, do and say uh, that can be hard, uh, expecting uh, autistic children and young people to always give them eye contact and you know, perhaps thinking of them as being rude if they don't, um, misunderstanding if a child or young person has a, a sensory overload and, and spirals into what we can commonly uh, think of as a meltdown. Uh, those kinds of uh, uh, of people barriers can be difficult too. So, so we we look at those different barriers and how to identify them, who to identify them with, uh, and then go through how to perhaps put uh, some um, structure in place that helps to overcome some of those barriers and make uh, the place we meet, the program we run, and the people that we're doing it with, uh, and uh, together a place where everyone can belong including autistic children and young people what would you say to those people who say well we don't have any people with autism in our church it's not a problem we don't need to think about this uh, look harder would be the, <laughs> uh, the, the the initial thing to say it's it's highly likely uh, that there are uh, autistic people in uh, in most if not all churches uh, lots of studies done about uh, how many people are autistic uh, but one that was done recently by the Department of Health in Northern Ireland uh, amongst uh, children suggested that as many as one in 22 children uh, are autistic. Now, uh, you know, roll that out across a, an awful lot of churches, children's work, and uh, that's going to mean that there's going to be at least one autistic child in there somewhere. But it, it also saying that, that oh, there's nobody here who's autistic, e even if uh, the slim chance of that being true is, is actually the reality. What that's saying is that, you know, we, we, we don't want to prepare for uh, the arrival of uh, an autistic child or young person. And it's always better to have things in place and to be ready for the arrival of a, a child or young person who's autistic or you know, whatever uh, uh, particular needs they, they might bring with them, uh, mm. than wait until somebody walks through the door. And it struck me that quite a number of the things you put in the book actually would relate to a, quite a wide range of, of abilities and disabilities rather than just autism. Yeah, and actually even beyond that, a lot of the things that are in the book would make children's and youth work better for all children and young people and probably for the leaders that are running those children's and youth groups as well. Uh, yeah, much of it is, uh, is stuff that... that um, yeah, it's, it's sort of common sense when you clock it and think, actually, yeah, that's that's a, a better way of doing things. Uh, but uh, sometimes we get into a pattern of doing things in a certain way, and it's always been done that way. And gosh, church is quite good at, at, at always doing things the same way. And so sometimes, yeah, it just needs a, a little prod to say, how about doing it this way? How about changing things that makes what we do work better for everyone? Mm. Now, you actually have a full time job in this area. You know, your additional needs ministry director, as it says, at Urban Saints. Yeah. Why did your organisation feel the need for such a post? Uh, so, yeah, I've, I'm full time in this role uh, uh, for the last five years and part time for a few years before that. It, it rolls back really to uh, a time in Urban Saints where 
we were looking at what we did and how we served and supported uh, the churches and children's and youth workers uh, and families workers that we connected with and thought there might be some gaps there might be some things that we don't do or that we could do better and so what we did was to uh, allow members of the staff team a little bit of time out of their work schedule to be able to explore that to look at perhaps something that they were passionate about uh, and to, to, to start something that maybe could uh, be a, a growing and developing part uh, of what we do at Urban Saints. And uh, I chose to, to start this area of ministry, uh, looking at how we support children and young people and children's and youth workers, um, particularly around this area, the broad area of additional needs. Uh, and uh, yeah, that, that grew and grew and grew to the point where it became a full-time role, which is what I do today. And then your book goes on to look at a, a whole list of areas and things that churches can do to improve things, to make, make a church a more helpful place for autistic people. And um, I'm interested that, you know, again, it sounds common sense when you start to think about it, but we don't always actually asking the autistic young people themselves and their parents what you can do uh, you've you've learned i presume from from experience that that's the way that really you should start yeah absolutely uh, it's uh, often we get caught in the trap of thinking that we've we've got to you know invent the wheel whereas actually there's a, a really good one rolling along already if only we ask uh, and so asking uh, autistic children and young people themselves and their families asking uh, any autistic adults that happen to be in our church community to perhaps give us some pointers as well uh, means that we're hearing directly from the people that we are hoping to serve and uh, you know that that's got to be a foundation point for any work like this is to actually hear from people journey with people take uh, their input and together to then work through what that means from the point of view of that um, premises program and, and people uh, change uh, that's needed. And uh, yeah, that's, that's absolutely the foundation point on which everything else is, is built. And uh, along with the list of lots of practical things, you say there's a particular role for leaders about changing culture. And uh, I, I'm with you there. Culture is a hugely important thing for, for, for leaders, a real acceptance, real efforts to integrate. Um, I particularly enjoyed your suggestion that we should be lions rather than meerkats. Would you like to tell us what that was about? Yes. Yeah. So I, uh, I, I talk about the, 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 the idea of meerkats and lions. So uh, imagine the scenario you've got a, um, a, perhaps a family in church on Sunday morning with a, an eight year old autistic child who is finding themselves getting overwhelmed by sensory input, too much noise, lights, people, uh, smells, all, all kinds of things are, are overwhelming him. And uh, he uh, ends up being sensory overloaded and spiraling into to what we might commonly call a meltdown. And in, those mom in that moment, yeah, you're likely to see two groups of people uh, that uh, you can identify in church. The meerkats uh, are uh, a, a uh, the folk whose heads all shoot up and swivel round and stare in the direction of uh, this family and, and their child and there'll be tuts and there'll be stage whispered comments about you know, bad parenting and naughty children and all these kinds of things, all of which are completely untrue and very unfair. Uh, but hopefully in, those, in that moment you also see the lions and lions uh, look after their pride, they look after each other, they're, they're very protective and uh, and, and you see the, the, the uh, lions in this church scenario who get around uh, this family and say, hey, what do you need right now? How can we support you in this moment? Uh, and one of the things that, that perhaps they can do is to also um, fend off the meerkats and say, hey, let's not be like that. Let's, let's help this family uh, and uh, this child or young person uh, as they uh, perhaps just you know, reground themselves and, uh, and work through this moment. Uh, and uh, and let's yeah let's learn together what some of those triggers were that created that situation in the first place so that we can help uh, that child to not experience uh, those feelings again yeah well thanks for those thoughts mark and and just a final question really um because you pack a lot into this book and for a church that hasn't thought about this before where would you start yeah i think uh 
again, it's, it's coming back to, to talking to, to people. Uh, so having those conversations with, uh, with families, with young people themselves, with uh, autistic adults in, in church. It's also about uh, having somebody that owns this, having somebody that champions this uh, within, you know, particularly perhaps the ch uh, children's and youth work, maybe in smaller churches across uh, the, the whole age range. Uh, where, when something is championed and owned, then th th it's given focus and there's a priority to it. And that doesn't mean that uh, everybody else can just sit back and let that person get on with it. It's all of our role to make what we do inclusive and uh, a place where everyone belongs and can develop. But having somebody that champions it means that uh, it keeps that focus. And goodness knows the last two years, churches have had a lot to deal with and a lot to adapt to. So it's very easy to see how some things can slip down the priority list a bit if we're not careful. Uh, and so having somebody who, who uh, really owns this and champions this can make a difference. So talking to people and listening to, to, to autistic people of any age that, that we've got in our community and then having somebody that champions this going forward are, are the two real starting points. And, and then that helps to create that culture change uh, that we've been talking about. And whoever it was that said that, uh, that culture eats strategy for breakfast uh, was absolutely right. Uh, we have to get the culture right first. Otherwise, whatever strategies we put in place uh, will fail. So um, those two things together help to create that better culture. Mark, thank you very much. And our best wishes for you in your ministry. Thank you. To get a copy of how to include autistic children and young people in church, go to the Grove Books website, where you can order it as a print copy with free postage or as a PDF. There are many more great Grove books applying the Bible to a wide variety of situations. They're written by authors who know what they're writing about. Growth books are bite-sized publications that you can really get your teeth into. Goodbye for now. Hope to see you again soon.